My guest today is Jeffrey Rosen. He is a legal scholar and the president of the National Constitution Center. He's the author of The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. You can find that book wherever you get books, but I put all of the books we discuss in the program at mightyheaton.com slash featured, so you can find it there. And I will add, Jeff Rosen is somebody that I've had multiple listeners request to come on the program, so I'm delighted not just not just that he wrote this book, but that it provided me with a pretext to invite him on and talk to him. Hello, Jeff. Hi, it's great to be with you. Uh, very excited. You are a very knowledgeable guy, and also, I think, just a, a fairly happy dude in all of the interviews <laughs> I've heard from you, so I'm looking forward to talking to you. Well, now now that we've redefined happiness as virtue <laughs> rather than pleasure, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can live up to it, but I... I'm well, supposed to have calm self mastery. That's the calm goal. Calm self mastery. Great. Uh, well, we'll uh, let's let's kick it off with this. Uh, there's all sorts of thought experiments and essays written about what the founding fathers would think of government today. You know that is too democratic or not representative enough, et cetera, et cetera. W when we're talking about not just government but worldview, how did they think? How did they think about themselves? How did they think the world? Where do you think the gap is between them and now? What would they be surprised about in terms of how we understand ourselves? A central connection they made, which we've lost, is the connection between what they called private and public happiness. And for them, personal self-government was necessary for political self-government. In other words, unless we could master our own turbulent passions and emotions, as individuals, we wouldn't be able to achieve the same balance and harmony in the constitution of the state. And once I rediscovered that original understanding of, of private and public happiness, I, I read the Federalist Papers and the writings about the constitution in an entirely new light, because the founders are so concerned, centrally, with demagogues. They fear that the republic is going to go the way of Greece and Rome. And they're not sure that the experiment will succeed. They say, as everyone knows, that virtue was necessary for the Republic to succeed. George Washington has that in his farewell address, and, and they're constantly talking about virtue. But now I, 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 can't, I could understand what they meant by virtue with, with greater precision. They meant self-reliance, character improvement, being your best self, not being buffeted by unreasonable passions and emotions like anger, jealousy, and fear which they thought would lead to ambition and avarice and to the mob and to demagogues, but instead achieving that balance and, back to where we started, calm self-mastery. It's not an intuitive connection. It, it, I, I had to read all this forgotten moral philosophy to kind of resurrect this, but it was so central and they just talked about it constantly. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about happiness for a minute. Um, the the you know, immortal phrase in the Declaration of Independence is uh, the pursuit of, or excuse me, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I have always assumed until encountering your book that Thomas Jefferson was borrowing a well-known phrase by John Locke that would have been very, very well-known at the time, but that happiness just was better branding than property because that that sounds more spiritual. And it seems that this is a phrase that is not something he arrived at haphazardly or as a branding mechanism, but it refers to very specific things. Absolutely. The phrase, the pursuit of happiness, was everywhere. It was in all the source materials that Jefferson and the other founders relied on. And, and I found the source materials just by going down Jefferson's reading list, the list that he would send to kids who were going to college and wanted to be educated. And his section that he called Ethics or Natural Religion has a series of moral philosophers, uh, both classical people like Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, and Enlightenment philosophers like Locke, as well as Hutchison, Ames, Lord Bolingbroke. So when you read those documents, as I did, you find that almost all of them contain the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, electronic word searches kind of confirm that, and they all used it to refer not to feeling good, but to being good, to the pursuit of virtue, not the pursuit of pleasure, and by that they meant self-improvement, using your talents to the best of your ability so you could be your best self and serve others. The phrase, the pursuit of happiness, does appear in John Locke, just not in the Second Treatise. Jefferson was criticized for plagiarizing the Second Treatise because big chunks of it found its way into the part of the Declaration that uh, called for revolution against the king. But the pursuit of happiness appears not in John Locke's Second Treatise, but in, in his essay concerning human understanding. And it's about 
how we form our ideas about reality. And John Locke says that we need to uh, engage in the pursuit of happiness, which means sober second thoughts, resisting your immediate passions or impulses so you can serve your own long-term well, uh, best interests. And the reason that Jefferson took property out of the Declaration, life, liberty, and property appears in John Locke's second treatise, but they're described as natural rights, but not unalienable rights. And property is not an unalienable right. So yeah, you, can, just, you can alienate property. That happens all the time. You, you have to. When you form a government, you give it the power to enforce contracts, and you obviously alienate property all the time. Um, what's an unalienable right? This definition, I was so exciting to resurrect it, comes, it's, it's used frequently, but Francis Hutcheson, the Scottish Enlightenment thinker, explains, an inalienable right is one that I have no power to surrender to government when I've moved from the state of nature to civil society. So I can't surrender to you the power, my power to pursue happiness, because my power to pursue happiness is exercising my powers of reason and conscience. And reason is inherent in who I am as a human being. It's a God-given right that can't be surrendered. I can't command y myself or you to think as I or anyone else please, because my thoughts are the product of my reason and my reason is unalienable. So that was Hutchison's explanation for why both the rights of conscience and the right to pursue happiness are unalienable. And you know, I, you know, I knew that it took a while to resurrect, but suddenly you see why if Jefferson is making a list of unalienable rights, he has to include the pursuit of happiness because it encompasses all the others. It's the very purpose of life. It's not only a right, but a, of a, but a duty that we have, a divine duty to live according to nature and reason. And that's how it ended up in the Declaration of Independence. Well, and, and you alluded to this right at the beginning of our conversation, Jeff, that happiness is the, or the pursuit of happiness as understood by the founders would not have been feeling terrific, having a good day, you know, I, I have some caffeine and I had a good night's sleep and, and I'm going to go play with or some uh, some other old timey British card game that it was that the pursuit of happiness was was something deeper and not so much about mood or vibes, right? So much so, it it really is the opposite. Um, it, the the core of it is a version of what we call today the the marshmallow test, which is those researchers at Stanford who told young kids if you uh, you can have one marshmallow if you want to eat it immediately, but if you can wait for 15 minutes, you can have two. And the kids who could wait turned out much better later in life. And as the John Locke expl explanation shows, it's resisting your immediate urges, including your unreasonable emotions like anger, jealousy, and fear, greed, avarice, so that you can deliberate with yourself and serve your long-term interests, uh, which will allow you to serve society. And it's just amazing how that was the definition of the pursuit of happiness that was you know, persisted from the classical era through the Enlightenment. It's in all the source documents for the Declaration. It consists throughout the founding era. And then it continues for most of American history. I, uh, just, I've done some great uh, meaningful book events at the FDR library, and Harold Holzer, who runs the FDR library, had Eleanor Roosevelt giving the classical definition of the pursuit of happiness as pursuing your talents and to the best of your ability in the 1930s and 40s. And I was just last night at the JFK Library, and amazingly, in 1960, John F. Kennedy defined he's, he what he called the classical understanding of the pursuit of happiness as pursuing your own talents and, and cultivating your, your best self. And the question is why it totally dropped out of the picture around 1960. And it was obviously a big f part of it was pop culture, which came to exalt uh, you do you and greed is good and let it all hang out and, and all those good things um, and came to see happiness as immediate gratification and pleasure seeking rather than self-mastery and self-reliance. It's an amazing and important cultural shift. So let's pick that apart a little bit. Um, there's... I think of the '60s as the kind of there's a lot of thing happening in the in the '60s, but one one cultural shift occurring is the the very libertine hippie dynamic of I am a hedonist. Look, if I'm not hurting anybody else, what I do with or put in my body is my business and none of yours, and so I shall. Uh, and then uh, in the '80s, you have Gordon Gecko, greed is good, uh, and so um, these are both kind of different versions of freedom. They're both different versions of liberty, but. Both of them are very self-directed, uh, and and they're so. Th how does that vary from what the founders would have looked at 
you, you put it really well, and, and it's the hippie culture is one version, and greed is good is is another, and and both of those uh, I- impulses are in the founders' view vices. Um, the the virtues are all virtues of temperance of the soul, to use Adam Smith's translation of temperance. And Ben Franklin enumerated them in his famous project to achieve moral perfection, where he made a list of virtues, and they include temperance, prudence, resolution, cleanliness, order. They're all glossing off the classical virtues of temperance, prudence, courage, and justice. By contrast, uh, uh, greed is good, the founders would have called avarice. It's one of the vices. It's the opposite of industry and frugality, which are virtues, and you've got to avoid it, or you go the way of Greece and Rome. Uh, Pleasure-seeking is considered an ego-based, selfish, kind of uh, unmastered thing to do, uh, and uh, that's got to be resisted as well. So you can serve your long-term interests. That's the very definition of happiness. The, The big vices in the classical world are ambition and avarice. And for politicians, they're just afraid that politicians are going to want to be greedy and corrupt and get as much as they can and serve their own ego-based interests rather than the public interest of the state by fanning up uh, the people and giving them cheap luxuries like bread and circus so that they'll get distracted and not argue for liberty. So there's a really close connection between the personal and political visions of happiness but you're completely right that the the, the hippie and, and 1980s versions are the opposite of the classical understanding. Right. There's there's sort of a um, there's a there's that that uh, freedom with responsibility kind of mindset. Both responsibility to yourself and if if we're going to really dip into other pop culture milieus, milieus, I feel like Oprah talking about living your best life might be the closest parallel to what they were talking about of this kind of, they would call it eudaimonia or something like that, of like flourishing in a, in a very vibrant way, but that that's different than just hedonism, which is very shallow and short term. And there's a, a larger responsibility you have to your fellow man or society or the state or something like that, which accompanies those freedoms. That's exactly right. Flourishing is exactly the right word. It's it's a good translation, as you, as you suggest, for uh, eudaimonia, uh, good demon or good spirit, and and hedonism, uh, pleasure seeking is the opposite. I what I haven't figured out is why it happened in the sixties. Though both of those cultural shifts you mentioned occurred, some here are some explanations. Um, David Brooks has blamed this uh, Freud's substitution of the idea of character for personality. George Will blames the Romantic era and the exaltation of autonomy over sincerity and self-mastery in the 19th century. Uh, others have blamed post-structuralism, which re- replaces the individual liberal idea with uh, viewing societal structures and groups as responsible for our actions. I mean, th- those are all helpful, but none quite pins it down. Do you have any ideas? Uh, I'm not sure, although I would love for you to sort out some of the cognitive dissonance that your your book has sparked in me, where I, the more I read it, I'm like, I kind of find the founding fathers more paternalistic than I had assumed, and I think they would view me as a sociopath. And I, and by uh, the way, I I don't think I'm a sociopath, <laughs> but but I'll but I'll unpack that though. Like uh, I I take it as a given. I don't think people are bad. I do think people are autocentric. That is to say that I I do not think I think most people are kind and are not cruel, but do want to maximize their self interest. And so I I look at when we're designing the system. I assume all politicians are going to be ambitious and narcissistic, and we just need to make sure that the levers are in place, that that ambition cancels itself out with other ambitions. And when we look at uh, the economy, and I I realize that Adam Smith's probably tortured more than any other thinker because no one ever reads his other book, but if I'm only reading the one book, um, you know, if all of the companies are all maximizing self-interest, it benefits the economy and the rising tide lifts all boats. So I would, both on the economic side and the moral side, kind of come down on that 60s, 80s dynamic that I think they would find terrifying. (laughs) Well, it's so interesting. Um, Of course, Jefferson was the great libertarian, and he would have agreed with you about uh, ambition needing to counteract ambition. Madison, who was his great colleague, said that in the Federalist Papers, that we can't assume that men are angels or that no virtue is possible, but that you design structures to check the inevitability of ambition and, and so forth. And uh, it, it, the party of Jefferson, which persisted 
throughout American history, uh, especially until the through the 19th century, until the Progressive Era, was was a libertarian uh, night watchman, uh, free trade, minimal regulation mm -hmm. party. But you're right that there's a part of Jefferson in particular, since he's the libertarian ideal, that did think that he he was not a libertine. And if this is really interesting, actually, so at the end of his life, he's talking to John Adams and about his philosophy of happiness. And he started off as a Stoic. He was inspired by Cicero and the Tusculan Disputations to think that calm self-mastery was the definition of happiness. And he says at the end of his life, I am an Epicurean. But by Epicurean, he says not hedonistic pleasure seeking. That's a libel on Epicurus, according to Jefferson. Instead, Jefferson said Epicurus, rightly understood, believed in the rational and voluntary contraction of desire so that we could calmly and virtuously meet them. In other words, not going for every greed is good bit of you know hippie fun you could get, but deliberating with yourself so you set you you, you had appropriate desires that that you could achieve using the powers of your mind. So I think Jefferson in his libertarianism would not at all be paternalistic. He was not in favor of government enforcing morality. See, in he any wouldn't way. have wanted like sumptuary laws to compel people to to be virtuous. No, and in fact, he's discussing with Adams, and Adams, during this exchange at the end of their lives, does endorse sumptuary laws. And Adams says, look, I know this is going to make some people laugh. It'll bring a smile to people because no one except me believes in sumptuary laws anymore. But he's an old-style Roman, you know, Christian nationalist, not in the modern sense, but he's both Christian and a nationalist, who, who believes that sumptuary laws might be appropriate, still an old Puritan in many ways. And Jefferson is not that. So this, in no way... Um, should shake uh, the faith of libertarians in Jefferson as a prophet. I mean, despite his great we'll, hypocrisy. We'll get into in some respects. of the other stuff later, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> there's it, there's some it, asterisks on Jefferson. Yeah, well, one, or, one or two <laughs> problems with his entire philosophy of happiness. But but it does remind us that it was not, um, he wasn't a hippie and he was not Gordon Gekko. He, he, was, he was the guy who made reading lists for people and followed them until the end of his life where you got to get up before sunrise read and write all day, cultivate your faculties, use every moment to improve yourself and to be a lifelong learner. Um, I, I guess the, the, the bit where I would, where I'm aware of this, this cleavage between me and the founding fathers is I'm very much a structuralist and I assume people are self-interested. And so for me, it's just getting the incentives right. And if you get the incentives right to where self-interest benefits the group, that system's going to work very well. I think the founding fathers would go, no, there is also there is also virtue, and if you just have a society of self-interest where you get the levers right, it's it's not going to work as a republic long term. There has to be civic pride. There has to be self-sacrifice. The the very like Kennedy ask ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Am I right in thinking that that they would have they would have viewed it more as just funneling self-interest or or something like that? That there, there's a, almost spiritual quality that needs to be cultivated in the soul of the country. Such an interesting question. Yes, broadly. There is the pursuit of happiness is a spiritual quest, which doesn't, and, and the quest for self mastery, the individual quest to be a better person has spiritual dimensions. But really, that they disagreed about how much virtue was reasonable or necessary to count on. And Hamilton, whose hero is David Hume, really does think that self interest is all, and you have to structure a constitution so that it is strong enough to suppress, uh, or, or rather, diffuse is the better word of uh, vice and selfishness and and so forth so he's not a classical roman we've we've all got to be like sparta and uh have nude exercise yeah, and, sl and sleep on the floor laws. and retire <laughs> yeah. the moment you achieve power yeah. and yeah. yeah absolutely yeah but but the, but it's important because they really disagreed at the end of their lives about whether the republic would succeed and that turned on how much virtue they thought was necessary. And Washington and Adams, who are more traditional and expected a lot of virtues, were really pessimistic. Uh, Jefferson is really properly concerned that slavery is going to break up the whole union, but he has faith that education can be widely diffused and that people through education can kind of master themselves. Hamilton's died earlier, but he um, expected less virtue. Only Madison is moderately optimistic because he's moderate about everything. He's always finding intermediate positions between Hamilton and Jefferson. He's he's looking for a middle ground and he has a very realistic view about human nature. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on, on Hume? And, and the reason I ask that, uh, we, and we can get into some deep 
deep thinkers now because we're going to get into what who affected all these people. It seems to me that most of the people in your book are really profoundly affected by old Stoics like Cicero and I, I guess he's not technically a Stoic, but Stoical philosophy um, and this very like very, very ancient Greek idea that reason and the mind is good and the world is profane and bad. And so the the goal is to take the the mind, which is you know rational and suppress the animalistic urges. Whereas David Hume comes along and goes, no, you've got it exactly wrong. Your your brain is always going to be in service of what you already wanted to do. It's it's a defense attorney for your will. And so it sounds like Hamilton's on the Hume side of that, that like, yep, your 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 brain is after the fact, but is everybody else going, no, cultivate the brain, suppress the body? Do you see a great way to put it? And you you really read it uh closely. So there, uh, there's a big debate between uh, Hamilton, who uh, is a, a follower of Hume, and Jefferson, who prefers the Whig historians of the previous generation, like uh, Algernon Sidney and Locke, and that determines how much emphasis they put on virtue and conscience. And Hume, as you say, famously says reason is and always ought to be the slave of passion. He he doesn't expect that our reason is strong enough to overcome our passions. He he has some hope that our kind of hardwired conscience might help a bit. And and, and Jefferson also uh, thinks that hardwired conscience is important. What's what's really what what I want to emphasize is none of them are just one or the other, or just ancient followers of the Stoics or of moderns like Hume. The point is that all of the sources, both modern and ancient, go back to Cicero. I mean, Locke says two, you should read two books, the Bible and Cicero. Hume cites, cites Cicero. All, all the Enlightenment thinkers themselves are channeling the classical wisdom and trying to figure out their own balance between the competing roles of self-interest, conscience, uh, you know, ambition, and, and virtue. But it's, Hume, it's, it's Hamilton's devotion to Hume that leads to um, the most famous dinner party dispute in American history. My next book is about how the clash between Hamilton and Jefferson defined all of American history. And Hamilton and Jefferson are at dinner, not the famous one where the rumor had happened that's in the Hamilton musical, but a year later, they have another dinner where the whole Washington cabinet is there while Washington is away. And uh, first Jefferson looks around the room uh, and and uh, Hamilton is there and he asks, who are Jefferson's three portraits of great men on the wall? And Jefferson says, well, those are the three people I think are the greatest men in the world, John Locke, Francis Bacon, and Isaac Newton. And Hamilton supposedly says, according to Jefferson, the greatest man in the world was Julius Caesar. So there's a long pause. And then uh, Adams and Jefferson are talking, and Adams says, British Constitution is the most perfect in the world except for its corruption. And Hamilton says, purge the British Constitution of its corruption, and it would lose its perfection. It's the corruption that makes it perfect. So this leads Jefferson to conclude that Hamilton is for a resurrecting a British monarchy style constitution based on corruption. But it may be the biggest example of misinformation in American history because Hamilton is channeling Hume. And Hume is the one who says the British constitution is perfect. And Hume is the one who says that corruption, by which he means the ability of the British monarch to offer offices to earmarks. So that the <laughs> earmarks, exactly. That what will give earn their loyalty and ensure that they're devoted to the central government. And that's the sense in which Hamilton is using corruption. He spent th till the rest of his life, he was denying the oppo research of Jefferson and the Jeffersonians who formed the entire Jefferson uh, political party to oppose Hamilton's supposed corrupt plans to resurrect monarchy. But it may have just been a huge misunderstanding. So H Hamilton might not have been saying corruption is good. He might have been saying, listen, you wigged idiot. Uh, people respond to incentives, and you need to build that into a constitution. If you if you have everybody running as a public servant out of sheer love of country, selflessly, you're this is going to collapse. You need to admit that they want to have honor, and they want to have money, and they want to have vacation time. And if you build that into the system, maybe you'll make it work. Something like that. Exactly. If he had had you as a speechwriter, he would have been in much better shape. <laughs> yeah, I would I would have kept the guy from getting shot. All sorts of things. Well, let's <laughs> let's. Absolutely. Let's backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, Cicero comes up all the time in the book. Uh, the, the Tusculan disputations come up. Uh, uh, the, the offices de Ophicis comes up a little bit. Who is Cicero and how does he affect the founding fathers? So it was this Cicero book that launched me down this whole unusual reading project during COVID that led to this book on the pursuit of happiness. 
Um, he's, I mentioned Ben Franklin's project to achieve moral perfection with 13 virtues. I noticed during COVID that Franklin chose Cicero as his motto from the Tusculan Disputations, without virtue, happiness cannot be. And then I saw Jefferson also made a list of 12 virtues, and he chose Cicero as his motto and this passage from the Tusculan Disputations about happiness being calm, self-mastery, and tranquility of soul. So I figured I had to read Cicero, and then it turns out throughout American history, everyone keeps returning to him. John, he's John Adams' favorite author. When John Quincy Adams is devastated over the death of his son who commits suicide, uh, tragically, he reads the Tusculan Disputations and chooses a passage from it as his motto, and it just uh, is really central for all the founders. So Cicero was a, um, he was called a skeptical philosopher. He wasn't a doctrinaire stoic, but he kind of wrote a popular self-help books that synthesize the wisdoms of different Greek philosophical schools. He was also the greatest orator of his age, who wrote the most famous books on oratory and delivered the most famous orations, including his immortal against uh, uh, Catiline, who was the demagogue who conspired against the Roman Republic and Cicero denounced in the Senate. And his, his orations were read for generations. He writes the Tusculan Disputations when his daughter Tulia dies, and he is kind of on the outs politically, and he uh, goes to his villa in Tusculan and tries to work out his grief. And the amazing thing about the Tusculan Disputations is it's an essay about how to deal with grief. And that was the book that the founders cited as the most important definition of the pursuit of happiness, because the idea is that by overcoming expectations about the results of your actions, not trying to control anything except the one thing you can control, which is your own thoughts and emotions, and abandoning your expectations about the reaction of others, you can achieve that calm self-mastery that defines happiness. And that's why so many people turn to Cicero at times of great tragedy. Cicero, as it happens, had a terrible end where he got on the wrong side of the war between Caesar and Pompey. He picked the wrong side. And in the end, he's executed on the command of the emperor. And famously, when the assassins catch up to him, he calmly presents his head uh, for the self-mastered death that he'd always argued for in life. So that's Cicero, and he was incredibly influential. I So I'm, I'm curious, uh, the Tusculan Disputations comes up a lot in your book, and it seems to me that that is primarily a, a stoical work built around that very stoic, almost Buddhist or Taoist idea of like, you can't control what other, you can't control your external situations. You can't control um, whether people esteem you or you're rich or anything like that. You can, so only worry about things you can actually affect. If you can't affect it, don't worry about it. Um, I, I would have thought anybody writing a book on the founding fathers would have gone with the offices because that has to do with obligations and moral duties, which I would have seen as more naturally lending itself to statecraft. Why did you go with the Tusculan Disputations? Absolutely. Such a great question. Because I was writing about the original understanding of the pursuit of happiness, not about uh, the influence of Cicero on the Constitution and government primarily. And the offices, I do uh, read the offices and talk about it in the Washington chapter. Um, but, it, but, but, but the stuff they read as kids about how to be good people were focused more on the Tusculans. And, and as I said, it just... It really surprised me that it showed up not only as the central text for Franklin and Jefferson, again, on, on private happiness, on how to be a good person, but also was such a through line later on with John Quincy. But you, what your question reminds us, this is just well, one half of the picture of the influence of classical authorities on the constitution makers. They also relied on both the classical and enlightenment people like Montesquieu in drafting constitutions, and that's a whole other important story to tell. Yeah, and I, I guess like with a lot of these thinkers, it's not just the mechanics, it's also the virtue side of it. It's like uh, I brought up Adam Smith a minute ago. I, I don't think Adam Smith would have thought he would be remembered as an economist. He wrote a, a moral philosophy book first. Um, like pe people will sometimes throw Smith under the bus because he points out that uh, slavery is not good economics because someone's just going to do as much as they can to not get beaten and stop. And they're like, what a horrible, but he spent the whole previous book talking about how awful slavery was. So you can't really divorce the sort of uh, 
virtuous morality from the mechanics of response or the mechanics of of you know balances of power and things N not at all you're so right humes was acclaimed and would have imagined himself as a as a moral philosopher and he has both the long versions and as, as essays about human understanding or the understanding of the mind and then the shorter versions which were called hume's essays that are more accessible and hume's essays are so often quoted at the Constitutional Convention that some people thought the delegates had memorized them. And they're among the only sources that are called out explicitly in footnotes in the Federalist Papers. He was, as I said, completely central for Hamilton and the Hamiltonians, but everyone read him. And he was, oh, and uh, if that weren't enough, uh, of course, he was the one who came up with the famous definition of faction, which Madison channels in the Federalist Papers, and Montesquieu had said that you can only have republics in small territories where people know each other, and Hume turns that on its head by saying that in a big republic, it might be hard for factions to mobilize, and by the time they do, the people will get tired and go home, and that's what Madison is channeling in Federalist 10. Uh, you bring up another member or another thinker within the Scottish Enlightenment, and that is Francis Hutchinson. What did Francis Hutchinson contribute? He contributed the definition of the distinction between alienable and unalienable rights. When I was in law school, I just wanted to know where it came from, and I was so eager to pin it down, and there, there are not that many primary sources in the founding era, except for Madison's um, uh, and, 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 uh, um, essay about religious liberty and, and Jefferson's Virginia Bill for Religious Freedom, and both of them are citing Francis Hutchison's definition of an unalienable right, which we talked about earlier. It's, it's right. something that you have neither a power nor a duty, uh, n n no power to alienate and a duty not to and I, alienate. I feel um, like but he would then be the godfather of like religious pluralism, I think, because he's kind of, he, as I understand it, the big thinker that goes, look, you can't actually compel anybody to believe anything. So why bother trying to do it with statecraft? Beautiful. I, I think so. He was definitely Jefferson's favorite... Uh, philosopher of religious freedom because uh, he because jefferson got his definition of unalienable rights from him and hutchison also is the one who says that we have a hardwired moral sense the, the the some of the uh john locke said we're just blank slates uh, the product of our external sensations and otherwise there's we're, we're born as as white papers and hutchison says no there, there's a hardwired moral sense that can guide us in deliberating between reason and passion where does Hutchison get that idea from? None other than Cicero <laughs> and the Tusculan Disputations, which he cites. So not, not original with him, but he was just a founder of the school that included uh, Adam Smith and David Hume and all of these great Scottish Enlightenment thinkers. Um, in the, I, I've never read the Tusculan Disputations. I think I pretended to read the offices back in college. I don't think I actually <laughs> read it, but what, what I remember writing about and what are the, te what are the tests that I did was that I, I I think that Cicero spends a good deal of time talking about the distinction between uh, m expediency and and morality, uh, and the conclusion he comes to is that they're a false dichotomy, and ultimately doing the moral thing is long term expedient. So yes. would he have like advised Jefferson, don't do the, Lu the Louisiana Purchase; it's not legally authorized; it oh. won't be good for you. That's such an interesting question. I mean, he would certainly have advised Jefferson not to. Be a total hypocrite on slavery, which was the which Jefferson knew was the morally wrong thing to do, and said so. This question of whether betraying your constitutional principles is a violation of private morality is really important because what I'm learning in reconstructing the way the Jefferson Hamilton debate played out throughout history is both sides are unbelievable hypocrites. They're strict constructionists when it suits their purposes, yeah. and as soon as it doesn't, they literally switch to the other side and become liberal constructionists of government power. And Louisiana Purchase is the famous example of that. I mean, Jeff just let's retrace Jefferson on this because it's so important. He starts off in 1784 defending Congress's power to ban slavery in the territories in the Northwest Ordinance. Then when it comes to the Louisiana Purchase, he rejects that broad definition of congressional power and secretly says, I'm afraid that this is unconstitutional. But then because he can't get an amendment through, he says, never mind and takes the broad conception. And then the Louisiana, the, the Missouri Compromise comes in, banning slavery in the Western territories. He abandons the original position he had because he wants to preserve slavery and says that's unconstitutional. 
And Roger Taney takes his later, but not earlier, understanding of government power in the Dred Scott decision. And the same thing happens for both political parties. It, it really actually rattled my, my confidence in the ability of these basic principles to constrain in any meaningful way, because both the Whigs and the Jeffersonians and the Republicans and the Democrats have been so opportunistic about using them. Yeah, one of the people that I gained respect for somewhat in the, in the book, I lost some respect for some of the founding fathers. I gained some respect for Patrick Henry, because Patrick Henry is at least aware of his own hypocrisy. He comes out and is like, I own slaves. It is completely counter to everything I believe and everything I'm fighting for and everything I'm preaching, and I have grown used to it, and I'm not going to quit doing it, and I'm a hypocrite, sorry. And I'm like, I appreciate the honesty there. Totally. Then you you put it exactly as, as he did, and the honesty is refreshing. He said, I'm a hypocrite, but it's, it's my avarice or greed. I just like the lifestyle, and I don't want to give it up. And that brutally honest confession was the core of why most of them are hypocrites. Je Jefferson said the same thing. He kept accusing South Carolina and Georgia of being avaricious or greedy because they wanted to keep importing enslaved people after Virginia didn't need to anymore. Um, but he also just liked the lifestyle that he had in Monticello, where he was waited on hand and foot by his own enslaved children, who he didn't even acknowledge until the end of his life, the product of his, uh, his, his sexual affair. You can't call it anything more consensual than that with Sally Hemings. And, and, he, and, and just the fact that he kept insisting that slavery had to end at some point in the distant future, but the future kept receding into the horizon because he just liked the lifestyle and couldn't give it up is, is just uh, one of the great stains on his legacy. I've, I've had people write in before that have told me that, that Jefferson was different than some of the other people because under Virginian law, you could not, you could not emancipate slaves if you were in debt. That were you to, to, were you to legally try to emancipate someone, they would automatically become the property of one of your debtors so that you could make the case that Jefferson um, could academically oppose slavery without having the actual ability to personally do anything about it himself. Uh, does that carry any weight with you, or is that just trying to split hairs to make him look better on deep hypocrisy? That's fascinating, and I'll look into it. He's obsessed with debt, of course, and he constructs his whole political philosophy around the idea that one generation can't impose a debt on another, and that's why we have to have a constitutional convention every 19 years, and that's why at some point, he even suggests that a national debt should expire and not be passed along to another generation. And his justification for why he couldn't free his slaves throughout his life was that he didn't want to impose debts on his um, daughters. Uh, but I hadn't encountered the claim that he feared that if he did uh, free some slaves and still had other debt, that the remaining enslaved people would be forfeited to the state. That would be a technical point that um, in no way absolves any of his hypocrisy, but, but is interesting. So I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, one, one would think if you were... I'll, I'll, I, granted, I got very little skin in the game, but if it turns out there's some island that I own and there's a bunch of slaves on it, I think I'd help them escape at this point. Um, so you could, you know, there, there were people that did that. Um to to, tenor, to turn our, our scrutiny to another founding father, uh, last year I read Aaron Burr by Gore Vidal, and it's very, very interesting looking at the founding fathers from Gore Vidal's perspective on Aaron Burr. And one of the things that Burr brings up, Burr in quotation marks, is that everybody's giving Washington all this credit for turning down the prospect of being a king. And what nobody brings up is that Washington didn't have any kids to pass on the throne to and strongly implies that if Washington had had, if there'd been George Washington Jr., there would have been a King George and a King George II and so on and so forth. Do you think that is just a um, fictional thought experiment Gore Vidal was playing with? Do you think there's any truth to that? First of all, Vidal's uh, Burr is a wonderful book, and I, I learned so much from it too. Um, Washington is so keen to step aside to be Cincinnatus, to go back to the farm. There was never any evidence that he yearned to pass it along, but it's, uh, you know, Vidal, but Vidal's Burr is certainly right that if he wanted to, he could have. He could have been a king for life. He could have not stepped down. And if he had had kids, he, he absolutely could have tried to pass it along to them. Such was the norms of the day. It was unthinkable uh, 
King George III said, if Washington steps down voluntarily, he'll be the greatest man in the world because no one had ever done that. And that was his greatness. I also learned from Gore Vidal's uh, Burr, he's got a great line about, Burr, of course, was the demagogue who Hamilton most feared. When Hamilton says, we've got to construct the whole constitution to prevent someone from coming in on horseback, ra- ro- roiling the democracy to overthrow democratic elections and install himself as a permanent dictator, he says, tis Burr, he, that's the demagogue he has in mind. But Burr's counter, as Vidal notes, is Hamilton should just look in the mirror. He's the guy who wanted to raise an army, uh, seize Spanish lands um, held in Louisiana, and uh, basically lead a insurrection among Spanish territory, and therefore he's, he's the real demagogue. But Burr captures the degree to which Hamilton was just projecting his own uh, fears about himself onto Burr so powerfully. We're going to finish up here in a minute, and so I would be remiss if I did not point out that to a great extent, the book you wrote is a self-help book. Uh, I have been gravitating towards all the fun, archaic uh, uh, concepts and history and ideas and things, but um, I think at least half of the book is a self-help book using the Founding Fathers as a template. So what are some of the things that that you have improved your own life in having studied these people, and what would you recommend to listeners that they could do that would further their own lives? The, the biggest takeaway is the transformative power of deep reading. This whole project it was an unusual COVID era project that led me to this unusual year I spent getting up before sunrise, watching the sunrise, writing these weird sonnets that were kind of fulfilling to do, and then writing the whole book, which I still can't believe I did in a year. And what that got me back into the habit of doing was deep reading for stuff outside of work which I guess I did in college, but have, have been spending a lot of time browsing since then. And that, I, I, just the life hack of now when I wake up, I have to do some deep reading or something creative, and I'm not allowed to check email or browse. And it's just like a superpower. It, it, you can write books, and you can write songs, and you can write sonnets. And I've been sharing this practice with folks as I'm talking about the book, and, and a lot of people are responding to it and saying that they too set time aside in the morning uh, for, for for creative work, for art, for music, for prayer, for, for and for most of all, for, for deep reading. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is it just blows my mind that all the books in the world are now essentially free and online. And I was able to write this whole book reading all of these ancient works just lying on my couch with free or nearly free editions. And it's, an, it's such an exciting time in human history with all the distractions and polarization and, and, and enraged to engage um, content online. For the first time in human history, we, we have all of the wisdom, the world that's just waiting for us to read it if we can find the self-discipline to do it. So that's my charge uh, that I'd love to share with listeners. Um, set aside time for deep reading and happy reading. Uh, just a couple of quotidian questions about that. Do you have a set amount of time you do every morning? Is it an hour? Is it half an hour? And then also, I am not a morning person. I rise from sleep as if from open heart surgery. And so <laughs> while I, I like the idea of doing deep reading every morning, I'm afraid I will just pass out while I'm trying to do it. So what would you <laughs> recommend to people like me and how much time do you use? Well, I, I found the sunrise to be just a wonderful deadline enforcer and there's nothing more beautiful in the world than the sunrise it's just such an extraordinary gift you can give yourself to be up to see it and reflect on it uh, i the sun sunrise time changes during the year right these days it's closer to 7:30 uh, in the um summer i guess it's uh earlier around 6:30 so g- getting up at a at a relatively similar amount of time and then just those those rules about what you're allowed to do during the time when you're um, up. And even if you wake up in the middle of the night, as I uh, often do, just using that time too for reading or, or you know, creative work, just what, what you put into your head, the images and thoughts turn out to be incredibly important. This was a foundation of the Enlightenment and throughout history, and just being really mindful about habits. That's another thing. You know, Ben Franklin, getting this from Pythagoras, said it's all about habits. And and, and all the founders are obsessed with time, 
and they've got these daily schedules and clocks, when you read stuff, when you have lunch, when you have dinner, what, what time of day, when you exercise. It's very much keeping that balance, healthy mind, healthy body, and just being mindful about all of it so you can achieve your potential. Okay, I'm going to try this. I'm not going to try waking up before dawn. Uh, I might someday, but that I think is a bridge too far. But what I will do is I do think it's, and I, I'm not perfect about this, but I do think it's a really bad idea to check your phone first thing in the morning because I think that yeah. you were you were kicking off your day by reacting to other things. And I think it's much better to have a cup of coffee, look at your to-do list, look at your calendar. What do I want to accomplish? And then once you've determined what you want to accomplish, then open the floodgates for all the stuff that wants your attention the rest of the day. So I, I'm going to figure out a way to put my phone not next to my bed from now on and uh, and and try to, I'll keep a book next to it. At least I'll, I'll try. I'll wake up and see if I can read. And if I pass out again, I'll put a second alarm, but I'll see if I can't do this. Because I think this would be a wonderful way to just keep enriching your mind. Awesome. And and remember, Ben Franklin said you should uh, take accounts every night and put a little X mark if you've fallen short of your goal that night. I tried that Franklin system for a while with a friend and found it incredibly depressing because there were all these X marks. <laughs> but, but self-accounting at night or before bed just leads to being mindful about it, which should keep you on track. Wonderful. Well, uh, Jeff Rosen, I've had a pleasure talking to you. I enjoyed the book. Um, we have really not gotten into, we've, we've maybe covered a quarter of the book. Uh, it's it's much larger than the conversation we've had. So listeners, I'll say if you're interested in classical philosophy, which is what we focused on today, if you're interested in self-help, or if you're interested in kind of the biography and or hagiography of the founding fathers, uh, there's a lot that I learned that I didn't know and I'm a history buff. And so if any of those topics appeal to you, I think you'll enjoy this book. It is called The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. You can find it on Amazon or wherever. You can go to mightyheaton.com slash featured. And Jeff Rosen, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great to talk with you. And uh, please come back on when you when you have that next book on Hamilton and Jefferson. Yeah. I would love to talk to you about that. We'd love to. Look forward to that. Thank you.